I'm very glad to have Ted Williams with me after something he described as a Kafka situation on the freeway, but he made it here and he's taking the time out of his busy days to talk with us about several things. Most of it will be writing, but I'm also curious about some other things, because if you look around, there's a lot of things people say that you did as a job, writing technical manuals for the army, selling shoes. And illustrating them as well, yeah. Ooh. And yes, selling shoes and folding burritos in a Mexican you know, storefront place and uh, selling insurance. I managed an art store for a while. Um, I stacked bricks and, uh, and, and tiles in warehouses uh, through newspapers for a living. Um, I've done a lot of weird things, but uh, it was all with the idea that I didn't want to commit to a non-arts mm. career because that was what I was trying to do, was to get myself going. So I had several years. I had a few decent jobs, too. And you also had a band, or have a band. Yeah, well, actually, I, I still play with the same guys, um, most of the same guys. Yeah, no, not really the same guys that we had our band years and years ago. I've, it's a frightening amount of years ago now. Um, so yeah, I'm still doing that stuff. Okay, yeah, I, I guess you grew up with music in your veins because you're from around here. Well, that's certainly part of it, yeah. Um, I, I was, I, when I was 10 years old, I got taken to the very first be-in in Golden Gate Park. Um, you know, which was the very first time that uh, I think that they had a free concert and the dead played and there was the first acid test, you know, and things like that were going on. But I was very young, as I said, so my main memory of Golden Gate Park that day is that there were women there without their shirts on. And that, you know, for a 10 year old kid, that was kind of overwhelming and beyond all the other details. So I couldn't tell you what the Grateful Dead were doing or if they were even playing when I was there. I just remember there were women running around without shirts on and we all, we, my friend and I, because it was a, our friend's dad who took us, my friend and I were quite impressed by that. Certainly something that drew a lot of people also to the scene. Yeah, I think so. But, but yeah, there is a, a huge personal history for me in music. This the Bay Area where I grew up and have lived a great deal of my life is, you know, a very rich storehouse of musical history in a number of ways. And so, yeah, and, and I'm a musical guy. And it's always been, um, I think, one of the things in my writing. Mm -hmm. I tend to feel it very musically. Um, a lot of what I sense about when it's ch time to change tempos or when it's time to bring a theme back in f feels very much to, the, to me like the, the same way that I, that I interact with music. Oh. That would, would, would have been my next question, because I, I think when I read your text, I can kind of feel the rhythm going in and out with longer sentences and then coming to a point back again. So thank you for answering my question before, <laughs> for proposing it. Yes, and I'm, I'm um, also wondering where, how do you go about revising texts and refining this? Uh, is, is the rhythm something that flows then naturally, or is something who ke someone who keeps tweaking and keeps rereading? Well. I'm not one of those people who is an exhaustive rewriter. What I tend to do is I tend to do a first draft that, although rough by my standards, is probably a great deal more finished than most people, most writers, because the complexity of the things I'm writing with intersecting plot lines and every character having their own arc and various, uh, here's a good German word, leitmotif, mm -hmm. being brought into it and brought up and brought down and things like that, requires me to do a lot of planning at the first draft stage because there's nothing worse than getting to the end of a thousand page manuscript and then discovering that you have to strip out one entire plot line or change it drastically because then all of the dominoes start to fall down and you have to stack them all back again. So I try to do as complete a job in the first draft as possible. The second draft usually is fairly short and, and is mainly me making it readable for my editors without you know, them having to constantly notice problems and sometimes to make uh, corrections on things that I didn't notice because I was writing over a long stretch of time. So if you get too repetitive, for instance, with certain themes or ideas, you may not notice it when you're spending seven or eight months to write a draft, but when you go back and read it in one or two nights, then you suddenly go, God, that's in there a lot. I need to get rid of some of those, whatever they are. Um, and then the third draft for me is usually where I try to bring back whatever the original music was that's gotten lost in all that chopping and changing. 
and to be able to write it almost, you know, well, very much as if I'm reading it and to feel, you know, the, the flow of the language, um, the, the individual things about the sound of words and, you know, repetition of, of certain um, sounds or, 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 or phrases or whatever that are either there for a reason or they're shouldn't be there and they're distracting so yeah yeah exactly but that's so for I always think of the, the final draft as as a polished draft where you are bringing it back to where you wanted it to be in terms of how how it reads how it pulls the reader forward then I guess you have a long and very intricate planning stage for everything and I also guess that you do a lot of research for instance when when reading Otherland I was very impressed for the researchers that must have gone into things like Bushman culture and languages and things like that. How do you find all of this, especially going back to other novels where internet was not as easily accessible as it, as it is now? Well, the, yeah, Otherland is actually one of those. There was there was virtually no internet when I was writing that because I was I started it in the late 1980s. Um, and, and and I remember saying to somebody at one point, it's like, there's like eight to ten books per chapter. Now, that doesn't mean I was reading the entire book end to end every time, but it mean, meant some substantial amount of research work because um, I made a, a number of tragic mistakes in terms of, of uh, limiting my own need for research and hard work. I, I hate doing that, and I did it in other land because not only was it, you know, was it, it had a whole real world component that was global, you know, it was countries all over the world. Then it was also near future, and it was not a post-apocalyptic science fiction novel where you can just say, well, everything blew up. You know, it's all different now. Or, you know, everybody, they're now ravening mutants, and so you don't have to worry about. No, I was writing basically 60, 75 years in the future at the time. And so if you're talking about a street in Durban or in uh, Sydney or something like that, it's going to be the same street. You have to look it up like you're writing a modern thriller, mm. you know, and it has to be accurate. Then, as you mentioned, there's all the folklore, the um, anthropological side of all these different characters because I was emphasizing the, the, con the human continuity. And as we get to the point where what are we going to be next, I was looking back also at who are we and how how have we become what we've become. So uh, that was very important. And anytime you're using somebody else's cultural heritage, you want to make sure that you're using it properly. And then, of course, the, the whole Otherland thing, there was a whole science component, which didn't have to be perfect, because I'm not a scientist, but it had to at least make sense. So I had to work with that. And then there was also the fact that every single one of these artificial virtual worlds was based on something. So each one of those I had to research and, and create almost like I was writing a separate book about that part. So yeah, by the time I was in the middle of the Otherland books, I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, what was I doing? I'm, how does anybody get themselves into a situation like this? Um, it's not so bad if it's one book, but then you realize you're going to spend six <laughs> or seven years of your life and every chapter is going to be huge masses of research. And again, there wasn't really much of an internet then. So yeah, um, research, that, all that said though, research is actually fun. And it's something I have to be careful I don't do too much of because it's more fun than writing. Writing is work, you know. I mean, yeah. even if you're having a good day and everything is coming and is flowing, there's a huge amount of energy that goes into it and into the, the you know, whatever it is that you're doing um, when you're processing material and turning it into words. Whereas research is, for me, is fun. It was fun before I was a writer, you know. I mean, I've always been fascinated by the world. So it's... Um, it's something I still do a lot of, and part of it is because that's the kind of books that I write, but part of it is also because I enjoy it. I, I love finding out new things, and I love squeezing them into whatever I'm working on. Do you ever, when you're finished and, and uh, the book's out there in the world, do you read reviews? Well, it's kind of a hard question to answer because I, I certainly, I have fans now that I consider to be, I've known so long, they're readers, I consider them friends. So I'm always interested in what friends have to say. And so I, I will make space for that. By and large, I don't read reviews, especially mm -hmm. now that they're so ubiquitous that everybody has an opinion. 
And um, it's not because I don't care about people's opinions. It's rather the reverse. It's that, you know, if I read 20 glowing reviews and then one person says, I don't know how this guy ever got to be a writer. He's stupid. You know, all of a sudden I'm overwhelmed with like horror and, and, and upset. And, you know, and, and the other good reviews don't exist. And I'm going to spend all day walking around saying, how could that person say that? And they can't even spell, you know, or, or whatever. So, you know, especially these days when there's so many available sources of reviewing, um, I've found that unless someone specifically says to me, Tad, you should read this because my wife does this mm. sometimes. She says, this person really gets something or, you know, it's not even necessarily always the best reviews, you know, but it's people who understand what I'm trying to do and then comment on it. But other than that, or, you know, reactions from people I know well. I kind of tend to stay away from them now because they just, the, the negative ones worry me. And then I say, okay, if the negative one is bothering me so much that I'm ignoring it, then maybe I shouldn't take too much pleasure out of the positive ones because then I'm getting a warped view. So maybe I should ignore those two. And after a while you realize, plus I don't have that much time to work anyway. Yeah. I, I think that's very interesting because that's something you keep on hearing with people, especially people who like you. You have sold millions of books. You have fans around the world, especially in Germany, by the way. Oh, I believe me, I know. <laughs> and, and there are lots of authors who quote you as being one of their um, inspirations, like George R. R. Martin. And uh, still, you are unsure when you read negative reviews. I find that fascinating. Well, and it's especially telling because I'm one of the more confident writers you'll probably ever meet. I think maybe in part because I did a lot of other things before I was a writer. Um, I had a lot of other creative stuff. I was an artist. I did theater. I played music. I did uh, radio. And so I've never considered, as some writers do, my writing is me. If you don't like my writing, then you are, you are finding fault with me as a person. And I, I'm not as attached to that. But it's still something that, you know, takes a great amount of oneself. And it's one's livelihood as well as one's life. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is funny. It's, it's funny how the negative stuff will almost all, as, and as I said, even like you get these things from people who are clearly illiterate, you know, who can barely put a sentence together and they're going like, this guy's crap. And why that should bother me when, when mm. you know, and more than any number of well-reasoned, well-written, positive reviews do, I don't know. I mean, because I, I am pretty confident as a person and as a writer, but you know, I guess we're just, uh, you know, at our most human level, we're all kind of secretly a little afraid that we will be found wanting. Do you then also feel the pressure when you go back to something that you've written some time ago, like going back to Austin Art with the last King of Austin Art books? Uh, or do you put pressure on yourself to live up with a new book to do what people see in the old books? Well, that actually snuck up on me with these books because when I decided, I had not wanted to go back and write a sequel to anything I had written before for a number of reasons um, because it felt to me like, you know, it would be some kind of an admission that I was just going to go back and mine my own work and, you know, that I wouldn't be going forward anymore. And for a number of reasons I won't bore you with, that my mind changed and I decided, no, I will write something based in an earlier world. So at first it was a perfectly normal project for me, you know, in the sense that I just started planning. And planning requires a great deal of sitting around and thinking, which is something I like doing. And I'm very good at. I can sit or I can lie down and I'm a complete pro doing, doing it either way, you know. As long as I'm not doing anything else, I am in good shape and a happy camper. But what happened was as when we announced it, all of these people again, primarily on the internet, but all of these people, including people who I were very dear to me, started saying, oh my God, we're so excited. You're going back to Ostin Art after 30 years. You know, what a great thing this is. Oh, this book was, you know, formative for me. This was a big influence. This was a book that got me through my difficult teenage years. All these things, which are lovely things to hear. But I suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm not just writing a new book where if I mess it up or I don't do a good job or whatever, people will say, oh, didn't like that one so much. But I have now the capability of destroying people's childhoods. You know, <laughs> it's like the responsibility to not screw up in such a way that it 
you know, retroactively destroyed the earlier books for people who had loved them, um, kind of shocked me. And at that point, I did start saying, okay, I do feel a little pressure now, which I don't usually feel when I'm writing, because I'm just writing the best book I can. So that was interesting, and I was kind of in a nervous mode about that until the first volume, The Witchwood Crown, came out. And then the reactions were almost uniformly, you know, this feels like a good return. It doesn't feel like, oh, he's, you know, knocking this off to try to capitalize on a past success. And it feels like the same characters, even though they're older and things like that. And that's what I was obviously working toward. But until I, I heard that mm. from the readers, the ones who were invested in the story, I couldn't quite relax. But now I'm much more relaxed. I feel like, okay, good. I, 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 I did find the right kind of sweet spot on that. And now I can go forward and just work on making it the best possible book that it should be. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to repeat at length that, yes, I also read the books, with the Austin Art books when I was younger, and they were formative in a way, but um, the things that I took with them, uh, with me from them is a certain sense of melancholy also, mm -hmm. because a lot of the characters, not only in the Austin Art books, also in Other Land and your other books, are kind of people who have lost something and that's what motivates them and and there's always this sense of things are going away and things are fading and this is it feels very intentional to leave someone with this kind of sweet melancholy well i don't know if it's intentional as that when you i think most of us who are writers and those of us who are serious about writing um, not merely about the fact of making a book or something but that writing is a way in which we express ourselves, you are inevitably going to let a lot of your own personality into it. And I think I'm one of those people who balances between being amused and horrified a lot. But I'm also one of those people who, because I'm very plugged in to the, the, my family, you know, my friends, my loved ones, that, you know, I can't help but and of course now I'm like old too, but I cannot help but deal with the, the, the fact of mortality, you know, that the world we live in is a succession of moments that will, none of them will ever come back. We will have the memories and build off of them. But, you know, it's a one-way journey as far as we know. And so, yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that most appealed to me about Tolkien, for instance, about the Lord of the Rings. From his point of view, it, it, it made sense in a different way, and that's a whole other story. Me, me and Tolkien, I could talk about for hours, but, but I think one of the things that resonated for me was this idea of passing beauty, you know, that the transience of, of happiness, which is not necessarily a bad thing. That's part of why happiness is something that we take note of because it's not the only way things are. If we lived forever in happy, happy land, we wouldn't appreciate happiness. Um, it's also one of the reasons I have trouble with the conventional idea of heaven, which I kind of worked through in the Bobby Dollar books, mm -hmm. is because the idea of an eternity of being happy all the time doesn't sound very happy to me. So it's very much part of who I am. It's part of what I'm concerned about. I, I probably have some deep-seated fear of death that I've dealt with by channeling it into my work and into the kinds of art that I like and things like that. So I, I don't think it's unusual and I don't think it's, it's anything special. I think a lot of people feel that, um, but I think it's very much you know, an example of how, how you find yourself in your own writing. You know, I, I mean, you find your themes, but sometimes you have to write a bunch of books before you start to realize, wow, I sure talk about that a lot. <laughs> you know, I wonder got, if I've got an issue there. Well, it's, it's something that speaks to a lot of people also when they read your writings. Um, oh, one thing, circling back to talking, that I, I feel is echoed in your writing is that the heroes are not the people who are, look like the heroes and who are the tough guys from the start, but it's the normal people, it's the small people. Well, it's a different kind of heroism. Um, I think we all understand that people who um, sign up, essentially, to, to protect other people, whether they are police or military personnel or firefighters or first responders, paramedics, you know, people like that, 
they are very admirable people, but they are also signing up for it. It's something that they have decided they wanted to do. They've been trained to do it. They are, you know, that's their goal and their plan and their path through life. Whereas what fascinates me is the people who have it forced on them. And because that's where a lot of times we find out who we really are, you know, and finding out who you are as a character in a book is what makes you interesting you know coming up against yourself and having to do things that you hadn't expected you might have to do and I think it's also a way for me as a writer to question myself you know and say what are my priorities you know at what point would I use violence to protect the things that I love and and why would I draw a line between this thing and that thing you know and where would other people draw their lines and you know all those kinds of issues so yeah I think there is a probably a big theme running through there of ordinary folks in extraordinary situations and with the new Austin art books also ordinary people who are not only forced in extraordinary situations but who are viewed by those around them as someone they don't feel they are, like Simon, who's yeah. not very happy with all the pomp and circumstance. Well, I mean, you and I just had a moment like that earlier where, you know, you said, I said something about, you know, not feeling very important or interesting, <laughs> and you said, oh, you know, I, I disagree, or something like that. And, I mean, that's, that's it. You know, there's, a, there's an, old, um, an old English expression, um, no man is a hero to his valet. And for those who don't know what a valet is, that's, you know, the personal servant who helps you dress. Not that, you know, <laughs> there aren't many of those anymore. You probably don't have one. I certainly do not have one. Well, you can tell from the way I'm dressed. But, um, and I think that's, you know, that is part of it is that it's always interesting to me as a writer when I'm, you know, because it's such a solitary thing and it's basically just an extension of who I've already, always been. And then sometimes I find out like, or I'm reminded that I have this public self of people who feel about my work the way I feel felt about the most important writers for me. You know, and so I'll stand up to take a picture with somebody and I'll realize they're actually shaking. And there's a part of me that just wants to laugh because I'm going like, this is me, you know, this is me. Ask my kids, you know, I mean, ask my wife, right? Is this somebody worth getting all excited and nervous about, you know? They'll tell you. Um, but at the same time, it's a tremendous honor that, that, you know, to be able to have an interaction with people that is as meaningful to them as this stuff was for me. And that's what brought me into writing more than anything else, I think, was that feeling of connecting with another sensibility, connecting with, with somebody else's ideas. We've all had the experience that you read a book you really love and you go, God, I wish I could just sit down with this person. You know, I wish I could just get to know them. You know, it's not just books, it happens with other things too, a comedian that you really like or a musician who you find particularly, uh, you know, uh, affecting. But it's always a weird dichotomy for me because, you know, I live in me and I'm not that interested in me. Um, if I were that interested in me, I'd be writing about me directly instead of the indirect stuff that creeps in, you know. But I'm, in, I'm finding more interesting things to write about. So it's a, weird, it's a weird balance, but for me, it's a comfortable one now, you know. It's like if I want to have that little bit of feeling like, oh, I'm important, you know, then I can go somewhere where I'm doing my professional self and I'm being interviewed like this or I'm signing books or, you know, and I'm meeting people and they're all being very nice to me, way nicer than I'd be to me, um, you know. So, and that's great. And then I can walk away from that and I can go home with my dogs and cats and kids and, 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 and Deborah and uh, just be like a normal schlub, um, you know. So it's all good. With no valet. Yeah, exactly. Okay, before we wrap it up, I'd, I'd like to ask a little bit about uh, world building because I kind of get the feeling that, that even if you're writing kind of classical fantasy, you always try to find to write the creatures and the themes and, and all of this different? Is this, is this kind of an obsession to not do it as it was done before? Well, it, obviously, one of the things about writing in a genre of any mm -hmm. kind, especially a commercial genre, because commercial genres are like a vacuum that draw in writers who are all trying to find their niche and they're all trying to set themselves apart from 
from others. And so all of us, I think, writing in a crowded genre have a certain desire to find something that we can do that will surprise people and that therefore we will separate ourselves from the others that are writing similar kinds of things. So that's part of it. But also, for me, um, I, I'm very much, the, the term doesn't really exist, but if there's such a thing as hard science fiction, there should be hard fantasy. Yeah. Um, and I kind of really want to make things that feel real, because that's the whole point of fantasy, is you are using the unreal, but you are presenting it to people in a way that feels real. And the key, and that's where Tolkien got me also when I was young, was this feeling that there were depths beyond what were being revealed in the books. And there were, as it turned out. But, but that feeling that this world is not simply like the, the backdrop at the back of a yeah. stage in a theater, you know, that if you open, if you pull that backdrop, then there's more world beyond it. So that really worked for me. And that carries over into things like monsters, you know, or, or other races where I don't want to create somebody or something that is only going to exist to occupy uh, a, a spot in a story. I want the reader to feel like, you know, no, these are just like things in our world that if you look into them, they, they have an environment, they, they're there for a reason, they have a way of making a life for themselves in that situation and you know they they carry on they breed they propagate it they're not simply like little things that are put you know in for the purpose of the story so in that sense i'm probably more like a science fiction writer and that i want to make these worlds as real as i possibly or at least i don't want to make them real i want to make them feel real and sometimes that is artful trickery and that's okay too if it works you know if it works but the main thing is i want the reader to feel like I'm only seeing part of this, and if I could come back here when the story's over, I could go and explore, and there would be things to find. That's the feeling I'm trying to bring across. Okay. So, let's, let's, let's do the usual thing. Next book that's coming out is going to be the second part of uh, The Last King of Ostenard, early in 2019. Yeah, it's currently scheduled in English um, for May of 2019. It's, it's Empire of Grass, and... Then I will be working both on at least one short novel and the third volume, which will both be Ostenard related. And at this point, um, I'm not sure which will be the short novel, but the last book will be called The Navigator's Children. I am determined, determined to finish this in three volumes. People are already <laughs> taking bets. My friends um, and, and readers are uniformly uh, disbelieving that I'm going to manage it because, of course, I haven't ever quite in the past. But I am convinced this time that I'm going to. So I will go on record here as saying the Navigator's Children will actually finish in one volume that can be bound into one book, and that part of the story will, will, will end. But I don't think Ostenard is going to end. And I'm looking forward to reading more out of Ostenard and from you. Thank you so much. And thank you.